Hello and welcome. Well, one of the most exciting things about having children is celebrating their achievements and the reaching of new milestones in their lives, from taking their first step to saying their first word and losing their first tooth. Now, as they grow from a baby to a toddler, another exciting milestone is moving them to the next stage from a cot to a big bed. But when is the right time and uh, what tips are there that can help you successfully navigate this transition? Well, to help Uh, We welcome our special guest, uh, infant and child sleep consultant and expert, Emma O'Callaghan. Now, Emma is a mother of three and also has a background as a midwife and IVF reproductive nurse specialist. Now, she has over 20 years experience working within both a hospital and community setting and extensive experience in working with infants and children in their formative years. Thanks so much for joining us, Emma. How are you? Oh, I'm good, Rachel. Thanks for having me. It's lovely is, to be here. Well, yeah, and thank you for your time because we know you're very busy um, and you're a busy mum of three, as we were just saying. Um, and from that perspective, you can bring both you know, practical and professional knowledge uh, to help the parents watching and listening, um, to help them Absolutely. find a, a solution that's unique to their child's needs because every child and every situation is different. Um, yeah. And as we were just saying, this is really an exciting milestone in a child's life and to see the progress into a big kid's bed. Um, But on the other hand, I guess some parents may feel like they're losing their little baby. So initially, I'd love to know, have you had many experiences with your clients um, and even with your own kids um, about this notion at all? Oh, definitely. Like I think um, it is kind of an exciting thing. You know, you've, you've had them in the cot for all this time uh and you just kind of want to get on to the next thing sometimes or you um often i see like a, a mum might be pregnant for the second time so the the family are expect, expecting baby number two and they think right now's the time to move our toddler out of the cot yep. um and and push them on a little bit earlier than maybe is ideal so we i mean we'll talk about that but that's a really big thing um that i see that we want to move them on and and i'll explain in a minute why i sort of say just hold on and wait a little bit (laughs) well tell us you know initially what are some of the main challenges parents face when transitioning their uh their, their baby um from a cot to a bed then Well, I think the main things are that overall people do do it too soon. So because of that, they're excited to move them or they're expecting baby number two, or sometimes it's because the baby, oh, sorry, the toddler might be um, beginning toilet training. So they want them to be able to, you know, walk out of their bed and be able to get to the bathroom and toilet, uh, you know, in the night and that sort of thing. But really, I always say, um, I I suggest that parents wait till their toddler is at least three years of age. So that's quite a lot older uh, than you would imagine. Don't you think a lot of, you know, because even two seems when you've gone through one and they finally get to two, you think, yeah, great, that'll be good. But the biggest challenge around this is that they just don't have impulse control yet. Their little brains literally are not developed enough to have that impulse control. And what I mean by that is if we say, okay, now you're in your bed, there's not necessarily even a rail on the bed or, um, you know, anything to kind of keep them in. And for the first couple of weeks, they stay there and think it's like they're caught and they don't realise that they can get out of it often. But then they start to uh, jerry onto the fact that they can get out of the bed and they will just keep coming out. So they just don't, if you say stay in bed all night, that's really hard for a younger toddler. And when they're around three, that's when they do develop this impulse control. They can, they don't have the impulse to jump out. They can listen to what you're saying and follow directions a bit more and stay in bed. And that's probably the biggest thing I see is parents just moving them too early. And when you think about three is a lot older than what the majority of all parents would know and think um, instinctively for themselves to, so, and do you generally with it, the families that you work with, do they sort of have this same sort of reaction that they're like three, really? Like it's, they do often, yeah. often they do. And it depends too, I suppose on, I mean, there's factors like the reasons why I would move them earlier than that are that, you know, say the toddler is a climber and they're starting <laughs> to get that little, you know, leg over the top of the climber. cot and, you know, some, 
some kids are just climbers. So you, you really want to be safety first. You, you can't keep them in that cot if it's not safe. So that would be one of the reasons I'd suggest to move them earlier is if they're climbing out. So the second you can see them getting the leg over the edge, you've got to move them. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I really noticed too, Rach, is that people, all cots are not the same and toddler, yes. our kids are tall. So I'll often like a toddler standing up in a cot, depending on the brand of the cot, it, it doesn't really for tall toddlers um, give them much time in the cot. And, and that's actually one tip that I'd like to sort of tell parents is to when you are out buying a cot, like even you wouldn't even think of this or I wouldn't have, um, try and get one that the base can go quite low. Yes. And generally there's, you know how there's generally two positions for the cot. You've got the top one when they're really, really younger and then you move it lower. Well, that second low point I find on some cots still isn't really low enough. Uh -huh. So, you know, check out whatever brands you want, but I would really suggest getting something that can go really low. So when they do stand, they're not being able to, you know, tip forward and, and get as though they were going to fall out of the cot. So that's, that's a really important thing as well. Great um, advice. Yeah, that's and, a big and, tip. And, and, and I think that that points actually in the article, which brings me to, to my next thing. Like we published your article and the title is Moving from the Cot to a Big Bed. So for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please tell us um, what the article's about and just what inspired you to write it? I think, well, it's about just that like when is a good time to move your baby to the big from the toddler from the cot to the big bed when is the ideal time yes. i get asked that all the time you know why hey, and when when do i do that what, what what should i be thinking about when when's a good time um and it's just a really kind of basic common question but i thought there are some genuine things that it would be helpful to know about it and i wanted my parents to you know, understand and know all that kind of stuff. So awesome. Like I said, yeah, the first thing right, so, you know, we go through why it's um, better to hold off uh, till they're older, this impulse control concept. Um, you know that, uh, I can't remember who did it, but there was that scientific study where they put three, two, three-year-olds in a room and, and put a lolly in front of them and say, I haven't, okay, no. and then the, yeah, it's like a psychology study and they, um, the person that's doing the research goes out of the room and says, now you can either have that one lolly now, but if you wait like three minutes and it's still there, when I come back, I will give you two to eat. So this, this notion of if you wait a bit longer, you'll get more, but they found at about three, most of the children tended to wait so they could get the two lollies, but often under three, they just couldn't wait. <laughs> they just eat it, even so, though they knew that they were going to get more if they just waited three minutes. That's fascinating. So, mm. so I guess so. The ideal time to move your child to a big bed is um, at the age of three. Would you say around their third birthday, or is it more yep. of yeah, yeah, around it's their third more birthday? Judge around the third birthday, but judge it on your own child. Like if you've got a child that really can follow instructions pretty well, and you feel like you know um is quite you know it's not not that little rebel toddler that just wants to rebel against everything you say and and will follow instructions then you could definitely move them a little bit earlier but um in my if, experience yeah the younger ones are harder what about as you were just saying about your the climbers you know what what if they are starting to climb out of the cot you know and and it's before that they're that three mm. you know, I mean should parents move them immediately so they don't actually sustain a broken bone or anything like that from from the yep. fall and hurt I themselves? do suggest that they move them immediately so I mean I've had um toddlers as young as 18 months trying to climb out or even younger sometimes but 18 months I've definitely seen it quite a few times uh so I suggest okay it's time to get rid of the cot um you can either take the side off the cot and just leave them in the cot for a little while longer um, or you can set them up in a big bed and the bed often beds you can get side rails for the bed so if you're worried yes. about them rolling out of the bed you can put the side rail on the bed or if you're still concerned that they're moving around so much and might still fall out what I also suggest is maybe just putting the mattress on the floor for six months so if they do roll they're going to be safer yes um, 
Yeah, essentially children do like space to sleep. Like they do, if they are getting big for the cot too, um, even if you have to take the side out and they're a big toddler, they do need space to spread out. So it's probably better to move them to the big bed, but maybe put it on the floor. Uh, and how about, I guess, yeah. when you, like parents are toilet training their, their kids as well um, and they need to go to the toilet themselves. Um, I mean, in, in, any, any advice there, I guess? Um, I what guess you just saying to take yeah. that side rail down so they can get yeah. out? Yeah. And it depends, once again, how old they are and how good they are at following instructions and what part of toilet training they're up to. Many just start toilet training in the day and are wearing night nappies still overnight. But some when they're just up to the, because it's such a variation of when of course. Um, toddlers, you know, get the gist of the toilet training. But some do start a lot earlier and they want to be able to get out of bed at night and go to the toilet and go back. And I think you've got to give them that option too, if that's where they're really up to. Yeah. Um, yeah, give that to them as well. In your experience then, how do parents know what sort of bed is best for their child then when they are sort of at that age of three or when, when, whenever they are making that decision? Um, you know, like how do they know what, what bed is best? I don't think the bed is such matters, Rach, that um, you'd want something that's not ridiculously high. Yes. Uh, I always think by the time they've gotten to this stage, for whatever reason, you've decided to move them. So it might be that you've had to move them because they're climbing out or it's just time to move them. You know, you're yep. thinking, okay, they're old enough now. Let's transition. You're turning into an older toddler. Let's move you into the big bed. One of the biggest things I suggest is get your toddler really invested in the move because... Yep. You know, it is an exciting time. It is, uh, they're sort of turning into the big kid. And um, <laughs> they always, uh, if you can get them on side with change, some kids love the change. Others don't actually want to move out of their cots because, yes. it, I mean, they do provide quite a lot of security for a child, this, this being in their cot. It's been their time you know, their bedtime place for How quite a long time yes, now. Yeah. yeah, so you sort of get them invested in the move and maybe get them to pick out a doona cover with you or the sheet set or whatever, you know, oh. so that they can pick something they like and or take them bed shopping, um, you know, all that kind of stuff to really get them excited and invested in it. And then when you're sort of doing all of that, you're gently talking about the rules as well. You're saying, okay, this is your bed. And now that you've got a bed, you don't get out of bed at night. Um, you know, you only come out in the morning, that kind of thing. Just gently tell them the rules as well. Yes. So and incorporate if, that as well. And if buying a new bed, um, you were mentioning before that for, for parents to ensure that the bed is um, low to the ground um, and what I've read as well, I'd love to know your, your thoughts on this, but there's um, a lot of um, other experts have also said to make sure that there's no gap between the mattress and the rail and the wall. Um, yep. So the toddler um, couldn't roll or basically get stuck um, between the, yes. the, the, the bed. So not to put it against the wall um, as they could potentially sort of fall through that gap. I just wanted to yeah. Safety. Yeah. Rachel is a massive thing. So that's another thing I always talk about when you are moving them, especially if they've had to be um, moved younger you've got to think then the, bed, the whole bedroom becomes kind of like the cot in terms of you've yeah. got to make it really really safe so yes don't have the bed exactly <clears throat> near the wall um have make sure the blind um pullers and everything are, are safe and tied up That's a, yeah, um have the electrical outlets well. covered yep. All of that kind of just safety stuff, make sure there's no shelves that they could climb up on and pull themselves down. <laughs> there's no choking has in the room, you know, batteries lying around or, or coins or any lids to things that they could put in their mouths. Because yes. one thing I always do notice is when they can, I mean, they will work out pretty quickly that they can get out of it. That's just what happens. And a lot of the younger um, toddlers, say 18 months, two years, they start to play in their room. And you might not realise that they're playing in their room, but they're just playing around and you might think that they're in bed. But if you don't make that environment safe, uh, you know, some nasty accidents can happen. So you've got to be careful Very. with that very important and you, you do provide a great list in the article also um with regards to i guess all the safety um hazards to be able to do a bit of a checklist um Absolutely. i wanted to ask also when should parents give their their toddler a pillow is it sort of during this transition phase um what there's are your not really a rush on that right i mean there's a lot of um i mean you would you speak to a lot of health professionals around this and a lot of 
uh, people say there's not really a rush on the pillow. So even when you move them, certainly not in the cot, they don't need a pillow. Yeah. And it is technically better for their neck and spine alignment if they don't even hold off on the pillow. Okay. But it's it's natural to want to put the pillow on because it comes with the sheet set and that makes the bed look of course, nice yeah. and part of the new thing. So I would say probably 95% of parents do use a pillow, but just make sure it's a really flat, a, a slim one. You don't want yes. a really big one for a small child's neck. That's probably if either nothing or quite slim, definitely. Yes. And do you find that that usually makes it a little bit more difficult for children to get to sleep and, and, and or to get used to the pillows or any other advice you've got with regards to that at all not not really i've never really heard parents really say anything or complain about that or and even even though with my own children that didn't seem to be a big deal i think they're yep. just so used to seeing pillows on the adult's bed that you know they kind of get it yeah, uh, yeah. i guess one thing i would say though is with the transition if there was a special blanket or comfort toy you know obviously you're going to take that over for a while as well um and you know, just if, especially blankets. So don't, just because you've got the new doona and everything, don't just ditch the blank, that special blanket that they had in their cot. Cause I still like to snuggle with that as well. Yes, definitely. And, yeah. and what are your thoughts, I guess, with parents setting a new bedtime routine to help ease that, that, that transition as well? Do you have any advice or any thoughts around that? Or what do you generally sort of tell parents? Bedtime routines for each other. I mean, great. If it's, um, the toddler's going to a cot or the bed. I'm, I'm definitely into bedtime routines. It doesn't really matter what your bedtime routine is. It's as long as it's uh, consistent. And the whole idea of a bedtime routine to me um, is that a child knows, okay, first I go and I brush my teeth, then I go in and mum or dad read me a story and then mm -hmm. I, or whatever order you want to do it in, there's no right or wrong, I get my pyjamas on, I get taken to the toilet, I have my last cuddles, I say goodbye to night to my toys, the <laughs> dog, um, you know, what? whatever way you, your family does it. Yep. But what that is saying to the child's brain is, okay, this is what comes next. And the final ending of this routine is that I go to bed. It's a predictable sequence of events. It's all leading up to bedtime. Yes. Um, and along that way, you're getting quieter and calmer and often the lights are dim and it's slowing the brains down of busy, busy toddlers that just need that, uh, it's really hard to go unwinding. From, yeah, unwinding. It's hard to go from revved up, isn't it, to suddenly you're meant to be calm and go to sleep. Yes, of course. So I would transition it. Yes. Yeah, a, a good wind down routine really for cot or tot, um, cot or bed. It doesn't really make a difference. I, yeah. I would definitely recommend that. And um, I meant to ask before also: should parents consider using a, a bed rail to stop the toddler from falling out of out of yep. the bed? And if yep. so, um, is, you were talking um, about safety earlier on as well. But it's it's also sort of ensuring there's no gap again, of course. But I just wanted to yes. ask: what are you, what are your thoughts on on well, bed rails? I, I think that's the tricky thing. Like you say, they're younger. Um, what a, another thing to mention too is they will work out that they can get out of bed, obviously. So there's that part of it. And one of the biggest things, this no impulse control, is they will just come and visit you. Like you'll put them to bed and you might be out, I don't know, watching television or doing whatever, and they just appear. Like, hi. <laughs> Didn't I just put you to bed 30 minutes ago? And like, hi again. You know, they're just curtain calls, I call them. They're like, I want water. I want this. I want to go to the toilet again. I want it, you know. Um, or you're asleep in the middle of the night and you just get a little visitor by your bed in the middle of the night. So they just keep coming out. So the rail is more a safety thing. But if you've got a toddler who keeps coming out of the bedroom, you've got to put that physical barrier up for them because they have no impulse control, which was often a baby gate at the door, one yes. of those safety gates at the door. So it sounds... I mean, some parents freak out about that and think, oh, you're caging them in. But it, it's no different to the cot. You've got to think of the bedroom then becomes the cot. Yes. And that represents the physical barrier. Um, so obviously you're making everything safe in that environment. But they need that physical barrier. Um, and then, you know, there's certain ways that I help parents teach them to stay in the bed and um, provide incentives for them to stay in the bed and, you know, lots of positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. 
um, sometimes do role play with their toys about how good their toy was that, you know, yeah, Teddy stayed great, in bed all idea. night and all this kind of stuff just to, just to help them get it. So, but the bed rail, what you were saying before, is more of a when they are already actually asleep, you don't want them to roll over. So I would recommend starting off with a bed rail. Three-year-olds generally don't need a bed rail, though. They're pretty good. They stay in bed pretty well. And um, what happens when, for example, you have a new baby on the way and the child, you need the cot, um, maybe, and also from a space perspective also. Um, and, you know, from, from, from that perspective, is it best to move um, your child at least eight weeks before you, your due date um, to, to maybe help them get settled in before the baby is born? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Yes, I would recommend. There's a few ways you can go about it. So yep. often when a mum's pregnant the second time, they might, Many, in my experience, many babies, I reckon 90%, start off going into a bassinet. So, you know, not an actual bigger cot, like a, just a smaller bassinet, cradle, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so they're little. And then they often, by about four or five months, they're getting a bit big and they're touching the top of the bassinet. So they need to move them out into the cot. Yeah. So if that's if you're a family that's got a bassinet, you've got to think, well, I'm realistically not going to be moving my baby to the cot till at least another four months after they're born. So you could keep your toddler in, you know, you don't need to rush them out of the cot because if you're using the bassinet. Right. And so don't do that. Uh, secondly, if you've got a toddler that um, I even sometimes recommend if you can borrow someone's cot, like if you just ask around families many people have oh yeah we've got a cot in the garage that you can borrow and don't need anymore or whatever um you know use that for a while if if your ch children were really close together you wouldn't want to be moving you know a one-year-old or an 18 month old to the That's bed the thing get two cots for a while yeah. yes yeah uh don't don't rush it but if they're older and yeah, I would prepare them by saying, let's do something exciting for you, you know, and make it this really exciting thing that they're get, getting the big bed um, and frame it in a really positive way. You're getting this because you're turning into a big girl or a big boy and we're so proud of you and we know you're up to this and they love to people please toddlers they love to rise to the occasion and inherently really want to please their parents and we know that you're ready to stay in bed all night and you know you pump them all up and then that's a good time to do it when they're a bit older <laughs> and i'd love to know just generally you know what you know in in your in your time and um and throughout your career have you seen the biggest mistakes um parents make just when like sort of going through this transition and, and moving them to a big bed um what, what are the biggest mistakes that you sort of see I think, uh, Rach, that's really probably the biggest one that we just touched on then is moving because the mum's pregnant. Um, yeah. Just that's and too early. a huge mistake. Just way too, just moving them too early yep. um, is the biggest mistake. And then also not thinking about the fact that because they can get out, well, if you've got a, a non-compliant toddler and many are naturally non-compliant that's they're meant to be but and they keep coming out that you might just think about putting that physical barrier that gate up and that's okay you're not being mean you're not doing anything wrong and it might only need to be there for three nights or up to a week or something until they learn that you you mean that they have to stay in their room because what i start to see is that toddlers that get out of their beds all the time they become really overtired. Like yes. A, they're just missing out on all that sleep overnight, mucking around, coming in out of the room, you know, parent walking them back to the bed. They appear another hour later. Um, that's a couple of hours every night of sleep that they're missing out on. And yep. they start to become really, really overtired. And then that impact, overtiredness impacts on daytime naps as well because you would have heard that saying sleep begets sleep. So the more sleep that they get the easier it is for them to sleep and the more overtired they get um it's sort of a, a bit of a you wouldn't think it but it's harder for them to sleep because their little bodies are running high on cortisol and adrenaline and it is actually harder for them to be calm and start to sleep so yeah i'm i'm all about doing it with this idea in mind that it's for the best for them because we want them to have great sleep you know we of want course. them to get the most sleep um the other thing I really see is 
early morning waking problems. So they might be pretty good staying in there overnight, but they wake up at 5.30 in the morning or as soon as that little chink of light comes in the side of the blinds or whatever, that just sets their <laughs> circadian rhythm to wake up and they, they just come into your room. It's like... <laughs> It's not but, warm yet. But, yeah, they're missing out on a lot of sleep on that end of things. So blackout um, curtains then, you're saying, suggesting? Blackout curtains, absolutely. Um, yeah, if I'm looking at, to me, like the ideal sleep environment, this is good for all the parents to know, is set it up right from the get-go with your little newborn. Uh, make the sleep environment as dark as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, reason being... Right, she's like, when we're out in the light, like where I'm sitting now, all the natural light's coming into my eyes and that builds up serotonin in our brains. Yep. Same with our yep. babies and our toddlers, even a little newborn. Like, um, you know, they're out in the kitchen, you're holding them or in the family room or taking them for a little walk outside. All that natural light builds up serotonin in their brains. And when we take them into a really dark space, all that serotonin is converted into melatonin, the sleepy hormone. So... That's just this really cool thing that we know hap that happens. There's been a lot of research done on it in the last five years and the studies are really showing that the darker the sleep space that they sleep in, much higher levels of melatonin are in these babies and toddlers' brains. So there's a really good, you know, scientific reason why we want to make it really dark for their naps. Yes. Um, and in Very toddler cute. land, a chink of light coming in in the morning um, really does set them off for obviously stops that melatonin being produced, but just, yep, it's day, you know, I'll start the day. So you want to be thinking about that, you know, do you really want your toddler appearing, getting out of their bed? You know, that's another reason not to move them too soon because I'll start to get really overtired from so early in the morning. As, yeah. And, and getting back to what you're yeah. saying about setting up the room, I just wanted to revisit some of the stuff about safety and the precautions oh. that parents should be following. Um, so you, you mentioned about childproofing cupboard locks, um, considering child safety gates in some um, areas of the house, maybe um, outside of the bedroom, also stairs, kitchen, kits, kitchens, um, external yeah. doors. So, so just so obviously the toddler can't let themselves out. M removing... Um, yep, in other yep. parts of the house, other sharp objects, uh, making, making making sure things are high and out of reach. Um, all those yep. electrical appliances, making sure that they're out of reach. Um, any bracket, yep. heavy furniture. Um, you did m mention earlier about the chest chest of drawers, um, yep. our bookshelves, and um, make sure that TVs, if if at all possible, are secured to the wall. Um, and or are, are out of reach where they can't sort of right. actually pull them down. Um, of course, removing any heaters, yep. um, safety plugs and unused power outlets. Um, very important is the mm -hmm. curtain and blind cords, ensuring that they're all sort of tied yep. up. Um, and that's um, something that um, one of our partners, Red Nose, um, are very mm. big advocates in also. Totally. Um, and uh, I even... Um, <laughs> last week actually had someone coming around we're going to get some new blinds here at home and um the, the guy was just saying that even when they're installing new blinds these days they've got to have different sort of uh, uh from a legal perspective ensure that the 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 cable is all tied up as well but that obviously something is yeah. is critically yeah. important um yeah. Also, things like medications and cleaning products and chemicals, making sure that they're mm -hmm. high and or in a locked cupboard. Um, and yep. other things like this, maybe in their, in their bedroom or in the baby, if you're having another baby or have another baby, um, you know, things like baby lotions, medications, vaporizer solutions, if they're poisonous. Um, and yes. just making sure that anything that's on the change table as well is, is out of reach for them as well. Um, we've all seen those... Yep. Um, hilarious memes where kids have just sort of covered themselves in thick pseudo, pseudo cream and all of that sort of stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. But it's so true, Rach. You've covered that off really well. That's such a, yeah. The other thing I find is um, corners of things, you know, how you can get the little protectors for corners yes. of little low coffee tables or, or tables or they heads on corners really easily yeah so yeah. look we've covered off a lot and there's as, as we we're mentioning there's a lot covered off in, in your article also from you know things to consider um you know why and reasons you should be moving your child to a bed to bedroom safety um and then of course setting them up in their bed but i mean overall how would you sort of summarize your key messages for anyone watching or listening 
Um, Rachel, I think what I see, I mean, this is we're talking about one real specific um, issue of, you know, how do I, what do I do? What MON's the ideal time, like we said before, and I think it's a great question to be asking because, as you can see, there is an ideal time that's waiting until they're older. Um, the biggest key, key thing that I see with the mums that I end up working with a lot of them wait till it's too late to get help. So when I'm talking about like with their baby won't sleep, obviously I help with sleep. Um, or their toddler is in massive sleep deficit because of reasons like this. And I help with children right up the age of five, but my most common zero to three would be sort of, um, newborn is a different thing and I do a special newborn package, but babies and up to three is my really common age that I work with. Get help sooner rather than later because often by the time um parents call me i i feel like their mums particularly are broken you know they're they're just exhausted they're uh i had a mum last week who said to me i just feel like i can't even drive at the moment i'm so tired i literally can't see properly from getting up seven or eight times a night to help her mm -hmm. baby get back to sleep and it doesn't my message would be it doesn't have to be that hard. There's help out there. It's really not as hard as you think to change it. And I, when I help people, I do it really, really gently and step by step and meet them at their, you know, work with their parenting style. So getting help for your baby's sleep does not have to be this big, scary thing that you feel like you can't do. Um, and get help sooner rather than later, I think would be the biggest message. Don't wait till you're so overtired and the baby's so overtired that they are really... Well, they're just not really thriving then anymore because they can't cope with life in general. And why do you think um, generally sort of parents sort of leave it um, a little bit later to sort of get support? What? Yeah, I think, Rach, it's a good question. Um, a few factors. I think there's, first of all, there's a lot of opinion out there. So they may, often I see there's a mum or a mother-in-law or a sister or a cousin who, or friends, all put in their opinion, this worked for my baby, try this, try that. And what they're really not seeing is, um, when I work with babies, I need to know the whole picture. I can't just know one little aspect of it because that might have worked for their friend's baby, but your baby is a completely different temperament and completely different weight and completely different feeding style and completely different, you know, which we, we look at all of those things. So I find list shutting out all the voices is hard um and then there's that little bit of them or big bit of the mum that thinks i should know how to do this i should instinctively be able to get this right you know H have i failed if i uh, if i'm reaching out for help um which you haven't at all <laughs> not one single Completely bit because some babies yes. are harder than others they they are some babies Oh, just snooze away and others do find it a little bit harder and with the some gentle good tips and some really good follow-up support you'll learn and understand so much to be able to apply it to your baby so I think it's a bit of that Rach family influence and then this feeling that I should know how to do um the other thing I see is there's a lot of information out there like there's it's all on the internet uh there's heaps of books so often a regular story is oh emma i've read this book i've done that i tried this i tried that technique but nothing's working um and really the reason why i find that it's not working is it's very hard to troubleshoot a plan when you've got no one to speak to and go well that was meant to happen last night but didn't mm. happen so now i don't really know what to do yeah um that's where sort of having that consolidated support really helps Wonderful. Well, look, if parents have got any questions um, for you and or want to reach out, whereabouts can they find you? So jump onto my website. I'm um, www.babysleepexpert.com.au. So, and you can see me, uh, follow me on Instagram at babysleep.expert and on Facebook at the baby sleep expert. So a few different awesome. ones there, but jump on my website. That's the easiest one. And, and just call me. Um, I'm always just happy to have a chat and, you know, 
just find out what's going on and give you my take on it and just help you. This has been an awesome chat. Thank you so much. And I really hope to have a chat with you again in the not too distant future. Take care and stay oh, safe. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Rach. Thanks for having me. Right, you're welcome. It. Okay, bye. Bye.